This English language A-level video is all about language and gender, a very meaty topic which we all enjoy. Lots and lots of theory and research gone into this, very good. So this is part of the language diversity unit for AQA paper two. Let's start with some contentious statements because people have, often have very strong opinions about language and gender. So let's see, do you broadly agree or disagree? Are you right in the middle? on the following sorts of statements. Number one, females will talk about anything, but men are more economical with words. Males use talk to be more competitive. Females use language to be more cooperative. Females are better listeners than males. Males use more taboo language than females. Males are better than females at telling jokes. Females gossip more than men. Females talk more than men. Okay, they're obviously very broad, contentious statements. I mean, you're a brilliant A-level English language student and you're very aware that there are all sorts of contextual and social linguistic factors that will determine your speech. So it's very difficult to come with, uh, with any kind of generalized statement about 50% of the population's language, 50% of the of population's language like that. Okay, but people do have strong opinions about these sorts of things, and they state them either implicitly or explicitly. Some of these are opinions are about um, how long people speak. So people have perceptions that males and females speak for different lengths of time. That's one thing. Um, some of them are about the, the purposes or the functions behind the language, that actually males and females are doing different things with their language because they've got different aims. They're trying to do different things. And then thirdly, uh, people make claims about the success of males and females, both in terms of being talkers and in terms of being listeners as well. So... I wonder how you responded to any of those statements. And I wonder if you were going off and interviewing a whole load of people in your family or your friends, how they also would respond to these sorts of statements. So this is what I'd be getting you to do if you were in my class. I'd get you to be exploring folk linguistics, which means the sorts of claims that people make, not based on data particularly, but anecdotal kind of instinctive reactions. So you'd be going off, you'd be testing the common perceptions in folk linguistics by people in your family or your friends to so those sorts of statements that we've already looked at. And what I'd be asking you to do is to keep a record of the responses. So, you know, writing down people's answers or recording them on your phone. And then, of course, identifying, well, what patterns are you noticing? What patterns do you hear amongst people's attitudes, opinions, and beliefs? Um, what evidence do they draw upon to back up their opinions? And what similarities and differences are you noticing between different sorts of people, particularly things like people, different age groups? And then I'll be getting you to be writing up as a formal report. So summarizing your uh, the patterns that are going on there, maybe starting with the topic sentence that I've put on the bottom of the slide there. This folk linguistic study of people's attitudes and beliefs about male and female language reveals the following patterns. Okay, now people have strong opinions about uh, gendered language and they have had for many a long year. So what I'm going to give to you is the passage that it comes straight from the textbook. From So this is from the AQA textbook, page 175. And it's a passage about the people of the Antilles Islands of America. And it's the middle of the 17th century. So what are they saying about language and gender? The men have a great many expressions peculiar to them, which the women understand but never pronounce themselves. On the other hand, the women have words and phrases which the men never use, or they would be laughed to scorn. Thus it happens that in their conversation, it often seems as if the women had another language than the men. 
the savage natives of Dominica say that the reason for this is that when the Caribs came to occupy the islands, these were inhabited by an Arawak tribe, which they exterminated completely, with the exception of the women, whom they married in order to populate the country. Now, these women kept their own language and taught it to their daughters, but though the boys understand the speech of their mothers and sisters, they nevertheless follow their fathers and brothers and perform, conform to their speech from the age of five or six. Okay, interesting, isn't it, in terms of language and gender? So this was a passage, it was quoted uh, in uh, a book called Language, Its Nature, Development and Origin by Otto Jesperson. It raises interesting ideas about language and gender. Here in this culture, for historical reasons, uh, it is perceived that some features of language were used exclusively by males. There is also this perception that some features of language were used exclusively by females. So there's very much in this culture the idea of gendered language. And finally, language use was clearly maintained to link to maintain a certain identity, in this case, a kind of gendered identity. OK, so the idea of gendered language has been around for a long time. We're going to take a look in this and following videos about gender theories. The four primary theories that mark out the 20th century, well, the first three of them are they define and judge women's language against that used by men. So we've got your deficit model, you've got your dominance model, we've got your difference model, you've got your three Ds. However, we're also going to be looking at more recent studies and the focus has shifted more towards how society influences the language you use and actually this idea of performance, the idea that we perform our gender by demonstrating features of supposedly male and female language. So we're going to call that diversity. So we've got our four Ds that we're going to be wrestling with. Let's go back to, says he putting the lights back on, Otto Jesperson. We mentioned him before, the quotation about the Antilles Island came from his book. Um, so he published a book uh, in 1922 called Language, Its Nature, Development and Origin. It had this chapter called, rather ominously, The Woman. Okay, and here he's arguing that women, much more often than men, break off without finishing their sentences because they start talking without having thought out what they're going to say. So this is the kind of level of linguistic analysis that we've got going on 100 years ago, where we've got sort of claims being made about gender, which are not actually based on any accumulated data at all. And they're very much the product of a patriarchal society with these sorts of negative pejorative comments being made. He also argued that women's language could simply be typified as lively chatter, since their roles consisted of the care of the children, cooking, brewing, baking, sewing, washing, etc. Things that for the most part demand no deep thought. So what you've got here are very entrenched kind of stereotypical patriarchal views about gendered language. So I don't think we would claim that Otto Jesperson is what we would call today a linguist a current day linguist, because his claims are not based on any uh, proper evidence. OK, so this is the realm of folk linguistics, isn't it? We would call Jesperson's work folk linguistics because they they basically represent those sorts of basic and flawed ideas about women's language that are actually more anecdotal than based on valid and reliable research methods. So now let's get started looking at the first of the Ds. Now, this first D we're calling the deficit approach. And this is the belief that the language used by women is inferior to that used by men. And this really came to the public's attention in the 1970s, principally through the work of this academic called Robin Lakoff, who wrote a book in 1975 called Language and Woman's Place. And her argument was that because, you know, we are living in a patriarchal society, 
in the States in the 1970s, where the institutions and the organizations and power resides with males, then that manifests itself also in the conversational habits of people. That when even sort of American white middle class educated speakers are talking together, and you might think, well, they're the most progressive elements in the world in the 1970s, even in those sorts of conversations, women are using language which is powerless. This is what Lakoff is claiming. That's why it's called the deficit model, that females are using deficient language that represents their deficient position in society. So we have to say straight away that, you know, Robin Lakoff didn't go off and actually collect linguistic data. These are based on anecdotal evidence. And it's very much based on a very, very narrow demographic because it's based on her friends and her friends were middle class and white educated speakers. OK, so lots of people have been critical uh, about Robin Lakoff and the lack of any kind of stringent methodology that she's used. But what are some of these features of powerless language that she's talking about? Well, here are four of them. I mean, there's a greatly long list here. You'll find th this list in all sorts of textbooks. But there it is on page 176 in your textbook. And I've just picked out four of the features here. One is about super politeness. The idea that females tend to be much more polite than males. So if they're asking for things, the requests tend to be indirect. And they don't do nasty things like swearing. So super politeness is what Robin Lakoff called it. She also called certain adjectives that uh, females were using empty. Uh, not a term that a, a current day linguist would ever use because a current day linguist would say, well, well, all language has some kind of semantic meaning. But Lakoff is calling some of the adjectives empty. And by that, she means words like divine and gorgeous and adorable. So words that kind of connote positive approval or disapproval of things. She's calling those empty vocabulary. Third thing that she points out is about tag questions. Now, tag questions, very fertile area for linguists over the years. Lots of research has been done about who's doing what kind of tag questions in what sorts of situations. A tag question, of course, is like the example there. That's a lovely scooter, isn't it, where you make a statement and then you put a question form on the end. Her argument is that females are doing more tag questions than males. And what it's showing is a kind of powerlessness because it's almost like they're asking permission from the other person or they're asking for affirmation from their listener. OK, and a fourth area that Lakoff is uh, identifying is hedging. So this kind of links in with the idea of indirect requests. I'm just going to the shop. Notice how we've got a mitigating adverb just there, which is kind of hedging the statement. So these are all the sorts of things that Robin Lakoff is pointing out in the 1970s in California that females are doing. OK, now her list kind of kickstarted a whole whole uh, cottage industry, I should say, about language and gender theory. Um, but it's quite interesting to link her points in with research findings from the 1960s and 70s and see whether actually uh, there is any actually supporting evidence. You could go back to William Labov going around the New York department stores in the 1960s. Remember him? Well, what he's trying to do is to see if there is a linkage between people's phonology and their social class. And he concluded that females of all social classes were more likely to use the high status form. In this case, it's the R phoneme, as in car rather than car. So females are much more likely to be using the high status form. So in that case, you could link that in with Lakov's idea of hypercorrection. He also claimed that women often demonstrated hypercorrection through the grammatical uh, formations of their sentences. They're more likely to say between you and I instead of between you and me, uh, despite the fact that between you and me is actually the grammatically standard form. And they're doing it in order to attain status, to get over to prestige. Okay, so there's some level of support there for Lakoff's ideas about women's deficit language 
from William Labov. You've also got Peter Trudgill. So Peter Trudgill, uh, one of Britain's earliest social linguists who did a lot of work in East Anglia and in Norwich, he found that women use the standard form much more frequently in formal situations to signal or gain social status. And if you look here on the, uh, on the bar chart, you can see it very clearly here. So this is about the pronunciation of the ing sound at the end of the verb, the drinking. This is called the vela nasal sound. And what he was interested, Peter Trudgill, was the, the local people. Could you link what social class they were to the fact that they were either pronouncing it in an RP way, with ing, or whether they were doing it in a non-RP way, as in walking like that. And lo and behold, he found a pretty stark relationship between your social class and your phonological feature, because here he's finding the middle classes are almost entirely using the velar nasal sound, they're saying walk in, and the working classes are almost entirely saying walk in like that. But the reason why we're looking at it at this point is not about social class, because it's about the difference between male and female. So you're noticing here that the, the females are tending to use the more prestigious um, RP form, the vela nasal, rather than males. So again, you could argue that that links in with Robin Lakoff's findings. Okay, and finally on William Labov, uh, he introduced this uh, noun phrase, um, gender paradox. So this is in response to one of Lakoff's claims that women actually use more standard forms of English. So he coins this term. It's a paradox, he says. And this paradox describes how, you know, on the one hand, women prefer to use uh, more standard forms, which have more status, allegedly. But he also states that women tend to be more creative with the language. That actually, it tends to be females that use the newest forms of language. They're at the very forefront of language change. So therefore, you've got a bit of a paradox going on. Like there's a juxtaposition of ideas going on there. Okay, so we've had a video where we've done an introduction really to ideas about language and gender. Uh, we talked a little bit about folk linguistics, didn't we? Um, I showed you the, uh, the extract from that 17th century clip. Uh, I mentioned about the four Ds, which we're going to be looking at in our next videos. Uh, we introduced Otto Jesperson. And we looked a little bit at Robin Lakov's claims and also some of the supporting evidence from Labov and Trudgeau. And in our next videos, we will be looking at the other Ds. And I hope you can join me.